I'm Claire Houlihan. I'm a research fellow based at the Tyndall Centre for Climate Change Research and CAST, which is the ESRC Centre for Climate Change and Social Transformation. My research broadly is looking at how we use ideas from social practice theory and other sorts of relational and human perspectives on consumption to inform policy making and intervention. And I wanted to introduce uh, a toolkit we've developed called Change Points. It's emerged from a string of ESRC projects that have been done over the last four to six years. Um, I was the lead on this toolkit development, but I'm sort of just the next in a string of researchers that have been working on here, which include Alison Brown, Matt Watson, David Evans, Mike Foden and Liz Sharp. It's also, we've been really fortunate in that we've been supported by a really great group of project partners. So this most recent round, particularly by people in the water industry and also across kind of different spaces of food and waste. And yeah, there's been really good uh, engagement throughout. So I, I quite like to start with this quote because I think it situates what we were trying to do really nicely. So in an era of dramatic environmental change, social change is desperately needed to curb burgeoning consumption. So this idea that actually the way that we live our lives, the way that resources are consumed and the way that demand is formed needs to change if we want to address socio-environmental challenges. However, calls to action have focused on individual behavior and technological innovation with relative silence from the social sciences. And this was kind of our starting point, if you like. We wanted to understand what it would take to address that relative silence. And so at first, this project was kind of about recognizing that there's different ways of framing intervention and that we need to be using the full range of possibilities for intervention if we want to address the kind of complex social environmental challenges that we face today. So this table sort of summarizes four different types of intervention framing um, theories of change, as it's sometimes termed in uh, policy spaces. So our, our first was about recognizing this kind of technological change or change in service systems that's designed to accommodate and compensate for unsustainable practices. We've then got these middle two tiers that are kind of different behavioral perspectives that position individuals as more or less social creatures with appropriate methods following on that either persuade and incentivize individual behavior change in different ways. Then there's a series of more socio-technical perspectives. So practice theory is one, transition theory is another, and there's other examples that position demand and consumption as the emergent outcome of social, material, and political developments in society. So it's more distributed and more systemic approach. And really, so what's telling is while there's been quite a lot of action on kind of the first three layers of this table, there are relatively few examples of purposeful socio-technical interventions being put into practice in industry and policy. And given the variety and enormity of social environmental problems that we face today, there's an open question about what more might be done if we were to take seriously this idea of socio-technical change. And so social practice theories are one of the more established sort of socio-technical approaches and demands as an outcome of different assemblages of materials, meanings, so ideas about the future, cultural conventions, sort of expectations that people have of themselves and of each other, and competences are like abilities to actually go about things in certain ways. And the beauty of practice theory it enables the unpicking of heterogeneous complexity, so it recognizes the complexity of social life which not only gives us a tool for social scientific research, but it also gives us a way of reframing policy problems. But while practice theories have gained considerable traction in, in kind of research spaces and lots of interest from policy institutions, there's relatively little evidence of kind of purposeful efforts to put them into practice. And for us, really, this is kind of a bit of like a reflection on academia and what we've called like the ABC of academic outputs. We're really great at doing research and sharing research, but there's this kind of underwritten expectation in the mode of academic outputs that research users will take our research and put it into action. But really, like, it's much more complex than that. So professional practices, policymaking practices, the, these are routinized practices. They are deeply enmeshed in sort of socio-material ways of doing things. Like, they, they are routine. They, the idea of evidence-based policymaking is that it draws on familiar types of evidence and puts it into practice in familiar ways. They use familiar sort of processes and tools and enact certain imaginaries about the future. And really to kind of unsettle these sorts of policy practices, then we needed something a bit tangible in forms of output. And so this is what took us towards a toolkit. And I love this quote. So there's loads of definitions out there on what a toolkit is, but this quote is a really nice capture of what it is that we were trying to do. 
So a toolkit is a metaphorical box of resources, processes, instructions, and materials to help someone implement something without having had to spend years thinking about it. A way for someone to access strategy and the intel included in it without themselves having to be an expert that developed it. And so change points, you know, fundamentally it's a workshop method. It's it's a, a booklet that includes instructions and also the kind of schemas, if you like, to conduct a practice oriented workshop. It's focused around six exercises. So the first is a problem scoping exercise. It gets people to think about what is the question you're asking and how do you reposition it in a slightly more practice oriented type way. And then the next three are a series of um, kind of opening up exercises that start to reframe this problem and the idea of consumption in more practice related terms before focusing on five and six, which uh, take these ideas and develop an intervention. And I wanted to talk about these kind of middle three exercises. So the first one is about recognizing diversity. It's one of the great things about social practice theories is it provides a really robust way of unsettling an idea of average consumption. So it's generally well accepted. Average, The idea of an average is unhelpful. It's useful if you want to predict future consumption, but it, it's really unhelpful in terms of thinking about framing intervention because it, it disguises a lot of the... But look at the diversity in that. So even something like toilet water use, which you would really expect is quite standardized over households with a similar number of people in it, it's not. And you can see this big dark green band at the top varies quite intensely between households. You've also got things like the showering there and the bath that like range from being non-existent to quite significant chunks of their average water use. And the, the point here really is to get people thinking about why. Why does people's resource use vary and what sorts of opportunities does that pose for intervention? And so Change Points guides anyone using it to think about how these personal differences, but also differences in household structure and the geography and things like this affect um, resource use. So it, really nice examples that have come out of workshops that we've run have been people thinking about sort of the, um, the water demand associated with therapeutic um, qualities of water involved in managing physical disabilities and things like this. And the other one is hairstyles. Actually, it's a really nice tool for getting people to sort of bring really mundane aspects like how we wear our hair impacts on energy and water use in the home onto the table in policy discussions in a way that otherwise they wouldn't. So the, the second one here and kind of the, the namesake exercise, if you like, is about tracing connections between practices. So recognizing that what goes on in people's homes is connected to practices that take place in other spaces, but also that it connects to other people's practices. So the example here is trying to trace the, the kind of the different ways that people use water through the day, whether it's about waking up uh, or getting ready, the kind of grooming, getting ready, whether it's getting ready for work or getting ready to go out. Getting clean, the sort of the, the flip side to that is once you've done whatever it is you were going to do, that act of getting clean, getting removing sweat, removing grime, removing stress and settling in the day. So this is really about recognising the ways that um, water use connects to different practices. So particularly exercising, working, caring, whether it's for self or others and the opportunities that that presents and the different kind of spaces for intervention. And so change points is the idea that there are recognizable moments in every day's routine where a person performs a practice. And in that moment of performance, there is the potential for practices to be reconfigured slightly differently. And that means there's a window of opportunity here for a carefully designed intervention to, in some small way, like we're not overstating this, you can't magically design an intervention that's suddenly going to change the way that people shower and get ready for work. But in some small way, to enable the pulling together of a practice assemblage in a slightly different way. Um, the final exercise, and this is kind of a staple for these sorts of approaches, is to think about mapping complexity and really kind of putting, putting a label on the many different sort of actors and what role and influence they have on the way we do what we do. And this picture is not very clear. I apologize for that. But you can see in it that there's things like the weather, there's things like the presence of children, the different different people's commitments to sport and exercise goals, the different spaces that they work in. So whether it's about bathroom design or other facilities that they have access to in the day, 
the types of clothing that they wear and therefore the connections to like the fashion and beauty industry, the, the role of advertising. And it's just a way of kind of really pushing this bracket about what is intervention, what are the different opportunities, the different sites and all these different actors that need to be pulling in the same direction if we are to create change. So with a couple of minutes that I've got left, I thought through, I, I talk very briefly through an example. Um, and we use this toolkit with Anglian Water to look at the issue of unflushables. So these are products that cause problems in sewers having been disposed of by the toilet. Um, things like wet wipes and menstrual absorbents, which combine with fats and oils in the, the sewer system and cause blockages. So for a sense of scale, the, the cost of fixing sewer blockages in the UK is somewhere around 88 million pounds a year. And about half of these are kind of accredited to unflushable. So it's a serious. And we wanted to use um, change points as a way to understand why. Why are these projects flushed? Why did they get there in the first place? And it, it provided a really nice tool to sort of open up this question beyond the idea of like, why why does an individual bin this product? Thinking about the the broader social material factors that actually contribute to flushing on flushables. So it highlights things to do with um, the commodification of hygiene, for instance, and the idea that actually we are driven to use disposable products. It sounds obvious, but it's not always on the table as an opportunity for intervention. Um, it's things like infrastructures and materials are designed to provide for a modern lifestyle, which is dominated by convenience and also to be cheap and easy to use, which affect the qualities of those products. It's also about the sensory experience of dirt. So even when health professionals are sure that the risks are relatively ne negligible, for many people, they want uh, products contaminated with blood and feces out of their hands and out of their homes as fast as is possible. And this is one route of doing so. There's also a gendered dimension. So there, there is a, you know, it's disproportionately women's products that contribute to these things. And so there is that kind of obvious thing, but men also use unflushable products and there's all sorts of other kind of gender dimensions to the individual product use. Um, and there, there is kind of the, the real key here was actually being a little bit cautious about the uh, disproportionately associating unflushables with women and with members of specific groups. There's things to do with product design. There's things to do with bathroom design. And there's also this kind of issue. So in the UK, more than most European countries, we, we expect a lot of our sewer system. It was designed and originally kind of marketed, if you like, as a way of removing wastes from the home. And it, it, it's become very expected that actually the sewer system will handle any sort of waste outflows from our homes, which it's no longer necessarily capable of doing. So this workshop brought together representatives from 30 different organizations across the kind of hygiene and waste industry, if that is an industry, to ask what can be done about it. And really, I just wanted to show here that actually it does provide a tool that gives imaginative resources to help think about uh, behavior change campaigns, essentially, in a very different way. So out the back of this, this is four of 10 uh, interventions that were designed and there is a report available online and all of them position um, the act of not flushing in very different ways to we would have got to if we started with any of the top three levels of that that table at the beginning so there's this idea of bins for boys actually lobbying for changes in the workplace regulations to ensure that sanitary bins are available for everybody baby boxes which runs with this idea of like giving people the experience and the opportunity to experiment with new things around a moment of change, there's the possibility of forming new habits and new practices. Um, Built-in bins, so this one, it's not a very good description of what this is, but it was actually kind of just a critical conversation really about how we design our bathrooms and how you incorporate effective disposal units within a bathroom space without it looking like a bin. And there was a lot of talk about stigmas and actually thinking about how you open up an idea of uh, menstrual dignity in schools and the idea that actually it's not such a gross thing to have to go and rinse a uh, menstrual cup or something like this and that there are stigmas here that need to be overcome um, in order to facilitate different forms of disposal practices. I'll finish there this is a series of references for anyone that wants to see more there's the kind of the three at the bottom which are the outputs from the unflushables project there's also the toolkit reference right at the top and there's a paper 
uh, two papers that we've written, one on the method and one of the kind of conceptual point of view. Thank you.